Good evening, everybody. Thank you for making a special effort to come out here this evening. We do appreciate that. And I want to make a sincere, I give a sincere welcome to uh, uh, Bruce and, and all the guys from the Skeptic Society. Thank you for going, coming out here too. We think it's wonderful that you're out here and we thank you for coming out. I spoke at one of their meetings, so it's fair they come to one of mine, isn't that it's fair? You come here and I'll go there and then we'll go back there. But tonight I just want to mention a few people. First of all, I uh, want to thank Ruth uh, Lincoln for putting all of this on, doing all the behind scenes. Thank you, Ruth, for organising it. And I do want to thank uh, Dr. Carl and Dr. Paul for being willing to come and publicly debate like this, no matter how professional you are, I'm sure they both have a number of butterflies, if not <laughs> big birds. <laughs> and we do thank you both for coming out and being willing to participate tonight. And I think, you know, all of us here want to say a great big thank you because this isn't something they've just done overnight. We wanted to uh, have this debate as professional as we possibly could and we, we thought that Dr. Robert Herschel would be the ideal moderator to help us do that. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's, uh, he's a wonderful educator. He has a PhD in legal education. He also sits as a chair of the Organisation for Legal Studies in years 11 and 12 in the Education Department of Queensland. So this man has very wide recognition He's also on the Queensland Studies Authority. He's on the Board of Teachers Registration, the Queensland Dean of Education Forum, Christian Schools of Australia in Queensland, Legal Studies Teaching in Queensland. And I think a guy like that, and particularly because he's got a black belt, <laughs> gives him every right and every qualification. I want to tell you what, it is a wonderful relief for me to have a moderator who is going to do the hard work for me tonight. And would you please welcome Dr. Robert Herschel as our moderator. Welcome, everybody. It's great to be with you here tonight, and it's terrific to have Dr. Paul with us and Dr. Carl. Um, I love debating, don't you? Or do you love listening to debates? Be it those comic debates on the ABC, or be it debating family issues at home around the kitchen table, be it educational questions or issues, be it formal debates. Having a dad who's a lawyer in my sort of background, well, that's life. And even on holidays, going and sitting in the High Court in Canberra and listening to submissions being made to the full bench, that thrills my heart. You might say, <laughs> you've got to be joking. Uh, didn't thrill our kids' hearts, Desley, did it, when we sat in the High Court, but um, to hear that level of debate and argument is fantastic. And as your moderator this evening, uh, I'm disinterested in the outcome rather than uninterested. If you don't know the difference, talk to Pastor John later on. This debate is about, does scientific evidence support a literal genesis? And as your moderator, I have a number of tasks. Tonight the task is not about winning or losing, the task is about informing you, getting evidence out on the table, weighing arguments, and letting you make some conclusions, because I am not your adjudicator tonight. There is a vast difference between being a moderator and an adjudicator, I'll explain that in a moment. I want you to keep your minds and your hearts open, to really listen. In education we call it active listening. Not just saying, oh ho, but active listening famous quote from Dr. Glenn Martin in the United States is, people ought to know what they believe and why they believe it. Do you know what you believe and do you know why you believe it? But I want you to listen to the second half of his quote. And people ought to know what they do not believe and why they do not believe that. So can we help you tonight? These wonderful participants in this debate tonight are going to help us in that exercise. A few little timing issues. The first Episode of speaking is 20 minutes. 18 minutes into that process, I will ring the bell twice. Giving two minutes warning. At 19 minutes, I'll ring it once. One minute warning. And at 20 minutes, 
and the speakers will cease speaking within 10 minutes. Sorry, 10 seconds. <laughs> this debate could rage for decades, literally, but we're going to try and keep a lid on it tonight in terms of timing. The idea of the first presentation of 20 minutes each is for opening arguments. That's where they can lay their cards on the table, show you all their stuff, argue their case. The second 15 minutes each is rebuttal. Rebuttal is the process where you argue against what has been said previously and no new material is allowed to be introduced but for the sake of rebuttal. We're not running a formal Queensland Debating Society type debate tonight but we are trying to keep to similar sort of rules. 13 minutes into that session, I'll ring it twice, given two minutes warning and ditto one minute. And at the end of that, same sort of rules, within 10 seconds they are to cease. Otherwise I think we come and um, cut them off. No, not quite. And then there's two sessions of 10 minutes which is the conclu con concluding part of the exercise. Again with a two minute, one minute warning, etc. Now there are a few house rules tonight and they are going to be strictly adhered to by me. I want the ushers or whatever you call them over in this auditorium to please note that if there is any calling out during the debate or if there's any photography being taken or if there's any recording being done, people will be yellow carded. <laughs> if I walk from here and yellow card you, deacons, ushers, please be aware who gets yellow carded. I will do the same to the speakers in terms of the presentation of their arguments. Uh, should a second yellow card arrive, it is automatically a red card. You know what that means, don't you? Or aren't you footballers over this side of town? <laughs> they imported me from down south, just south of the river, not south of the border, for that exercise. In other words, the debate is to be conducted in a personal and professional manner with respect and courtesy to each speaker. The material presented must relate to the debate of the topic, the topic of the debate. Personal statements which reflect on any speaker are unacceptable and not allowed under the rules of the debate. And should I feel, and I have sole discretion here, I feel a bit like God tonight. The moderator feel that any speaker is violating the standard, yellow cards or red cards will be used. I think we're going to have a fantastic time tonight. And I would ask you to think about your strategy, your tactics, your argumentation, listen to what's being said. And I would like you to keep score. Because after all, this is about you. This is not about necessarily the debate. And as Dr. Carl and Dr. Paul talk, I would like you to establish some criteria of your own, something like, what's the stuff they're talking about? In other words, the content or the matter. Is it relevant? Is it useful? Is it interesting? How comparable is it? And keep store, score. If that one's a four on a 10-point scale, well, that one might be a four and a half or three and a half or 10. What about their strategy or their method of presentation and, and usefulness in the context of the, of the debate tonight? What about their ability to argue the case, especially their ability to rebut the opposite positions? And I think it's up to you to draw some conclusions. So I'm interested in letting the debate begin. Are you? Got your seatbelts on? You ready to go? Now we had an interesting way of deciding who would speak first. Ruth and I electronically were communicating with each other and we came up with the idea, I'd send an electronic number to Ruth in an email She'd keep that private. She'd send out my email to Dr. Carl and Dr. Paul. They would have selected a number between 0 and 16, in other words, 1 to 15 scale. Carl chose 13, came back electronically to the south side. We do have connections across the river. Uh, Dr. Paul chose 5. I had chosen number 4, which meant that the person who was furthest away from my number was to be the first speaker. So Dr. Carl... You're our first speaker, and I would like to introduce him to you tonight. As you come in, get ready, Carl. Dr. Carl Whelan is a speaker in great demand on the scientific ev evidence of creation in the flood and its relevance to Christianity. Able to hold audiences, both academic and lay, with his knowledge, easy to listen style, and ever present humour, he's lectured extensively across Australia and overseas. Dr. Whelan is CEO of Answers in Genesis in Brisbane, Australia. This ministry. Uh, Organisation produces the family magazine ex, uh, Creation Ex Nilo, now going to over 36,000 people throughout the world in 110 countries. It was founded in 1978 
and he's current editor-in-chief of that, that magazine. He's also authored news, numerous articles on the subject of both Creation Magazine and in-depth articles in journals such as TJ. He's the author of a book, compact book on stones and bones, and he's co-author of The Answers Book, One Blood and Walking Through Shadows. Both of these books are among some of the popular books on, on the issue of creation in recent times. and have been translated in several languages. Although his formal qualifications are in medicine and surgery, Carl has not practised in medical professions uh, since 1986. He's the past president of the Christian Medical Fellowship of South Australia. He's joint CEO of Answers in Genesis Ministries International and also serves on the board of directors of Answers in Genesis Ministries in the United Kingdom and the United States as well on the, as the advisory board of the Indonesian Association of Creation Research. It's with uh, great pleasure I introduce Dr. Carl Whelan to you tonight. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Can I just check those sound levels now that all the people are in? How does that sound? Am I going to be okay? And uh, we've got the lights, so we're ready to go. Does scientific evidence support a literal genesis? By literal genesis, I mean just as it was written, the historical account of creation of all things by God in six 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago, followed by a global flood. Friends, let's look at the big picture. If we try to explain this incredible world full of living systems bursting with complex coded information with its people capable of music, art, science, great literature, there's really only two options when you boil it down. One is that everything was made by an uncreated intelligence, which by definition is supernatural. By the way, uh, if you wonder why I don't include the option, was it made by aliens on the planet Zork, that would simply shift the problem to the planet Zork. You know, you'd have to ask were those aliens created or not. The only serious candidate for such an uncreated intelligence, I submit, is the God revealed in the book of Genesis, the foundational book of the Judeo-Christian Bible. Even the Quran, written hundreds of years later after contact with Jews and Christians, makes allusions to Genesis events, albeit with significant modifications. But that God of the Bible, there's a bottom line. He made us, he owns us, he sets the rules. Or the other alternative, if someone wants to reject this God, then it's philosophically necessary to claim that everything made itself, which is another way of saying that it evolved somehow. You see, no one would believe that everything made itself just boof in an instant. So any such concept, by definition, must get stretched over millions of years. And that's why in this discussion about the literal truth of Genesis, we're going to be talking about things like evolution and millions of years, because if they're true, I submit Genesis isn't, and vice versa. I believe there is much scientific evidence consistent with Genesis. But this might surprise you when I say I believe there's also scientific evidence consistent with evolution. If that does surprise you, then maybe some of the things I'm going to say in a minute about the nature of evidence and how science works might be helpful. Often, by the way, it's the same evidence. For example, evolutionists claim that the reason why there are certain similarities between living things is because they have the same ancestor. For example, people have five digits. So do frogs, so do elephants, and so on. And, uh, of course, that's evidence that supports evolution. Of course, if you look at it and you say, well, a Porsche has a horizontal, horizontally opposed air-cooled rear engine, so does a Volkswagen, it's not because they evolved one from another, it's because they had the same designer, then you can see that the same evidence can be seen to support Genesis, the idea of design by one designer. But there's additional evidence that casts doubt on the evolutionary explanation. Because if there's a common ancestor that's responsible for the five digits of the frog and the five digits of the human, then that implies common ancestral genes, which in turn implies common ancestral pathways in embryonic development. And here's the problem. Uh, the way they develop in the embryo is quite different. In the human, it's a plate and the material between those digits dissolve. In the frog, it's a growth of the digits uh, from buds. Um, many think that science is just a whole bunch of facts that sort of you put them on the table and they speak for themselves. But modern philosophers of science know that that's not true. 
In fact, uh, the great evolutionist, Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, a late uh, professor of all sorts of things at Harvard University, paleontology, geology, even the history and philosophy of science, um, he said, facts do not speak for themselves, they are read in the light of theory. But it's important to note that with origins, you're sort of applying a different type of science to that popular conception of, you know, that science is about things like rockets to the moon and so on. You see, rockets to the moon, that sort of science, I love science, by the way, always have. And that's to do with things like how the world works, you know, the laws of physics and so on, like gravity. You know, if you don't believe me how fast things go down, you can check it out. You can do an experiment. But if I was to come and tell you that reptiles turned into birds 150 million years ago, even if that was true, think about it. What experiment could you do ultimately to check that out? Investigating the past is science but it's more like forensic science, you know, historical science, if you like. It's a bit like, you know, those TV shows, CSI, where you get all these clues and so on. They get a bit carried away in that show and they try to tell you that the facts speak for themselves, but in fact, they don't. We tell stories about the facts and those stories are based on assumptions. Assumptions are unprovable beliefs that have a lot to do with our personal beliefs and biases and so on. By the way, if I refer to the website at any time, uh, that's the address, and I'll uh, try and show it again uh, towards the end. Even the tiniest life forms are chock-a-block with incredibly complex coded information systems. The biggest hurdle for evolution is to explain how these marvellous biological machines, which are capable of repairing themselves, making copies of themselves and so on, how they first arose from non-living matter. Now, friends, the living things obey the laws of physics and chemistry, but there is no tendency in the laws of physics and chemistry to make living things. In fact, the famous astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle, he said that if you think of the probability of getting just one of the many information-bearing biomolecules, the long-chain molecules on which life depends. You know, you need lots of different ones, but let's look at the probability of random shuffling giving us only one of those. He said it's like having the whole solar system packed shoulder to shoulder with blind men, each shuffling a Rubik's Cube. Now imagine what's the probability that they will all hit the right solution simultaneously at the same time. You know, living things do arise today. They arise today because of the information, the computer programming, if you like, that they carry, which they're programmed to pass on in turn. It is scientific observation which tells us that to make information systems, you need either existing information systems or intelligence. It sounds a lot like Genesis. God's intelligence imposed upon raw matter to create those first groups of living things. The famous scientist, uh, Professor Paul Davies, many of you will have heard of him, made this comment. He said, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living thing. I submit if the process can't even get started, then in one sense, there's probably not much point in all the rest of the storytelling. Friends, I submit this is scientific evidence strongly supporting literal Genesis. According to Genesis, God created separate populations of living things, basically different types, types, to multiply and fill the earth. Now, they weren't able to turn into one another, but Genesis doesn't even remotely imply that these individual populations could never vary or adapt within their kind. In fact, natural selection, which was thought of incidentally by Edward Blythe, who was a Christian and a creationist uh, quite a few years before Darwin claimed the idea was his, is actually an important part of the modern creation model. But natural selection does not create information. Natural selection gets rid of information. Evolution needs a way to create massive amounts of new information, and I'll define information as specified complexity, so as to progressively turn protozoa into pelicans, palm trees and ponies and so on. Mutations is what evolutionists turn to, to, to generate that new information. These are chance copying mistakes in the genetic code, in this complex computer code. But the key is that when you look at these inherited defects, and we're all carrying hundreds of them inherited from copying mistakes from previous generations, where are the ones providing those requisite uphill steps? 
many, many muta mutations are just neutral, just meaningless gobbledygook. Thousands of them give us serious inherited diseases. By the way, sometimes a defect can be beneficial. For example, if you're a beetle on a, wing on a windy island and you have a mutation that means all your offspring can no longer have any wings, that's a great thing, so that natural selection after a time will make sure that all the beetles on that island have no wings. Why is that? Because when you have wings on a windy island and you take off into the air, you're much more likely to get blown into the sea and drown. But this shows you how this defect, this loss or corruption of information has happened. It doesn't give you even the faintest hint of how the complex engineering information to make wings arose in the first place. The mathematics of the neo-Darwinian theory would indicate that of all the many countless mutations there are happening in the natural world, hundreds if not thousands of these identifiable mutations should be information adding. Israeli biophysicist Dr. Lee Spetner spent years at Johns Hopkins University in the States as a research fellow on this whole topic of information in DNA, specifically the signal-noise relationships in DNA. In his book, Not By Chance, he says, all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. So what are we saying? We're saying change happens, but change that's happening is in this downhill direction. Notice that even if there was a handful of mutations that you could identify, it wouldn't be enough. By the way, I'm a little bit more generous than Dr. Spetner. I think there, there might be one dubious candidate for an information increase. Artificial selection, as breeders do, is a parallel to natural selection. And breeders have been able to generate all these different diverse types of dogs from an original genetically much more rich mongrel dog population. You get Chihuahuas and Great Danes and so on. But this is also culling, thinning out, sorting out of information, large pool of information going to smaller pools. You see, each one of those has less information. That's why if you start with, great, with the Chihuahuas, and you wipe out all the other dogs in the world, you can breed and select in all your evolutionary fervor, but you will never, ever get Great Danes again. Simply, the information is not there. And this sort of thing is consistent with the Genesis big picture, where you have original created kinds such that the zebra, the horse, and the ass, for instance, by this same sort of process, could have been the offspring of one created kind. So notice how you can take wild horses and you can break them down still further to get these more specialised types, each with less and less information, each heading more and more towards an informational dead end. By the way, notice that zebra, horse and ass are different species. We actually get excited when, you know, there's things published about that someone's observed a new species forming in nature. Why do we get excited? Well, because it always happens astonishingly fast. That's what the evolutionists call it. It surprises them. And you see, I don't believe that Noah took a dingo, a wolf, and a coyote on the ark. I believe he took two of a canine kind. From that, you had to quickly generate. Within a few centuries, dingo, wolf, coyote, that sort of thing. So this helps us to explain that when we see speciation happening quickly. Genesis would imply that fossils should also indicate discrete kinds, but with variation. Darwin puzzled about this. He said this, quote, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Darwin blamed it on the imperfection of the fossil record. But 120 years later, after countless millions of fossils, Dr. David Raup, uh, field director of the uh, Chicago, chief curator of the Chicago Field Museum wrote that the situation was even worse than in Darwin's day with even less candidates for transitional forms. By the way, that does not mean that there were no possible candidates in Darwin's day or Raup's day, but it does mean we can spend time arguing about a handful of controversial situations when if the reality was as Darwin logically predicted, heaps of links and chains upon chains, There'd be no answers in Genesis ministry. There'd be no need for evolutionists to have developed new theories of evolution, punctuated, rapid, jerky evolution, or evolution by jerks, as it's been unkindly called by its opponents, to try and explain away the fossil record. And perhaps that's why the zoologist Mark Ridley said recently, no real evolutionist uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. 
Genesis tells us that there was a massive globe covering catastrophic flood lasting over a whole year with the breakup of subterranean water sources implying immense upheavals. The founders of modern geology knew why there were billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The millions of years idea took over science because of a philosophical rejection of the flood substituted by a belief that geological processes had virtually always been slow and gradual promoted by a lawyer called Charles Lyell. This is what Stephen Jay Gould says again. He says, Charles Lyell was a lawyer by profession. His book is one of the most brilliant briefs. Lyell relied upon true bits of cunning to establish his uniformitarian views as the only true geologist. geology. He says, in fact, the catastrophists were much more empirically, that means, you know, experimentally, if you like, uh, observationally minded than Lyell. The geological record does seem to require catastrophes. Rocks are fractured and contorted, whole faunas are wiped out. Lyell imposed his imagination upon the evidence. The catastrophists were the hard-nosed empiricists of their day, not the blinded theological apologists. By the way, it doesn't mean that Gould believes in uh, anything other than millions of years and evolution, by the way. There's tremendous evidence of rapid geology. Fossils themselves, you know, we see layers stretching over huge areas with billions of well-preserved fossil fish and of course if a fish like this wasn't buried quickly with the sediments hardening quickly you'd have a vanishing fish you know that's just common sense you wouldn't have an actual well-preserved fossil fish sometimes it's even more obvious this evidence of rapid burial you have a fish buried in the process of uh, or didn't even finish eating its lunch you know sedimentary processes when you look at the rock record they occur over huge areas you know, uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of square kilometres. For example, the Coconino Sandstone in the USA, the Shinarump Conglomerate, Dakota Sandstone and so on. There's simply no parallel in today's sedimentary processes with things going on on that sort of a scale. And uh, many modern geologists are now saying, well, we agree that the layers themselves were laid down rapidly, so they're putting the millions of years in between the layers. But have a look at that diagram. See how, it's not a diagram, it's a photograph. See how the, the top of it is all as you'd expect after just a few centuries of erosion, you'd expect gullies and ridges and all sorts of things. But notice how all of the individual layers are horizontal. No evidence of this huge amount of millions of years of time in between, which should have shown you all of these erosional features and so on. The evidence indicates that at least in this huge region, all of those, those layers were laid down rapidly, one on top of the other. Sure, there are some unsolved problems and there are controversies in flood geology and that's not unusual in science. For instance, there's arguments about the boundary, you know, where exactly is the flood end and the post-flood fossils and so on. But we're not without some ideas. For instance, most of us would agree that human fossils are all post-flood, probably the mammals too. People would have seen this, these waters rising for months and months. They would have had the sense to head for the hills. They would have built boats and all that sort of thing. And eventually they would have drowned not buried by sediment, therefore not fossilised, and they'd float, bloat, rot, fall apart, and so on, so you'd expect them to be very rare. You know, it's easy to, in flood rocks. It's easy to be simplistic. People often say, well, human fossils, you don't find them in the same rocks as dinosaurs, so therefore dinosaurs and people couldn't have lived together. Well, is that so? You know, here we have uh, a picture of a coelacanth fish fossil, also found in dinosaur age rocks, and none of these fish fossils are found in younger type rocks, so using that same logic as for the dinosaurs, you'd have to say humans and coelacanths could never have lived on the same earth at the same time. But we know that's not true, because in fact we have uh, coelacanths living today. You know, a group of, of creationist scientists working on radiometric dating have just recently published some bombshell papers They've taken zircons from deep granites that are supposed to be 1.5 billion years old. These zircons contain uranium, which is decayed to lead. If you measure how much of that uranium and lead there is, it's 1.5 billion years worth of, radium, uh, of uh, decay at today's rates. But the problem is helium, which is also produced when uranium decays, leaks out very, very quickly between the lattice, between the gaps, and it's produced by that, and therefore, there shouldn't be much helium in those zircons, but there is a massive amount of helium still in those zircons. And these carefully refereed experiments showed that helium over a wide range of temperatures was measured to leak out so quickly that those crystals in that so-called 1.5 billion year old granite 
could not possibly be older than about five to six thousand years, plus or minus a few thousand years. And what does that mean? That means that all of that one and a half billion years worth of radiometric dating must have happened in only those few thousand years, which um, confirms the prediction put forward by creationist scientists that there was a pulse of accelerated radiometric decay in the past. So billions of years dates become thousands. This is direct scientific evidence powerfully supporting literal genesis. Mr Chairman, the affirmative rests and is out of time. Thank you. How are you feeling? Have a little move. You've been sitting still for 20 minutes. You ready for Dr. Paul? I'd love to introduce him today. Paul Willis got into science as a kid and has never got out of it. He found his first fossil at the age of six and has been hooked on paleontology ever since. Moving to Australia at the age of nine, he found his fossil in England. UK, England. Moving to Australia at the age of nine, Paul went on to study geology and zoology at the University of Sydney before completing his PhD at the University of New South Wales studying fossil crocodiles. Paul has been a science reporter with a major public broadcaster since 1997, regularly appearing on radio, TV and online. He also tours with the public events Science in the Pub, Cafe Scientific, as well as presenting public lectures and seminars in a variety of science-related topics. Paul broadcasts weekly radio science talkback seg segments in Western Australia and the Northern Territory and broadcasts similar segments to Tasmania every couple of weeks. Paul is passionate about science and communicating science. He's equally passionate about protecting science from pseudoscience and paranormal garbage that is so prevalent in our society today. Quote from Paul Willis. Shall we introduce Dr. Paul Willis to you? We might have to go with your version. Okay, Ladies and gentlemen, before I get started, um, <laughs> For an atheist, it's pretty tough when you realise that providence is against you. Um, uh, but for some reason, the CD that, we, that I burnt this wonderful PowerPoint presentation to for today uh, didn't work on the computers down here. Um, and so I, find, uh, I, I, I want to start out with a thank you to the guys who got it working for me. Uh, Steve and Dave, uh, there's a few others there. Can we have a big round of applause for them, please? I really would be cactus without this, folks, so I really appreciate their, hope, uh, their help. Uh, something I have to make abundantly clear before I start is that some of you may recognise me from working at the ABC. Oh, can you hear me now? Some of you may recognise me from working at the ABC. I am not tonight representing the ABC in any way, shape or form. Yes, they're a bunch of pinko, commo, leftos, but... Advoca advocating against creationism is not one of their portfolios. Um, and I think, oh, the other thing is, is that with this presentation, it's unfortunately, it's in a longer form and I haven't had time to cut it down. So I may be racing ahead, but don't worry because it will be up on a website later. You'll be able to go back at your own leisure <laughs> if you can use a computer, which obviously I can't. Um, and uh, and you, you can uh, re review this later. So just bear with me. There's some wrinkles here. Mr. Moderator, if you're prepared to start, so am I. Uh, first of all, anything on the screen? Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me along here. It's not often that we uh, have the opportunity to do this kind of debating. Um, hands up if this is your... I, I just want to get a, a sense of who I'm talking to. Hands up if this is your lo local congregation, your regular congregation. Good, OK. Hands up if in the last couple of weeks you came along to the creationist seminars that were held at this church. Right, so there's some people primed and ready to go. Ready, ready for an atheist burning, are we? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hands up if you love God. Excellent. Hands up if you believe the Bible and that God is the creator of the universe. Then I'm pleased to tell you tonight that I am not here to tell you any different. Christians have nothing to fear from what science teaches us about the history of the world and the evolution of life. And I'm not just saying that as an atheist. I'm saying it because there are many, many Christians who are regular scientists who believe not only that Jesus 
uh, saved, uh, Jesus came to earth as, as the Son of God to save our souls, not only believed that God created the world, but also believed that it's something like 4.6 billion years old and that, it, uh, that life has evolved on earth. And I'll be getting onto that later. One thing that these Christians, like myself, do not believe is that there is any evidence for a literal creation. Well, you might say, so how do I know there's no evidence for a, a literal creation? Well, maybe the first thing you could do is ask a creationist. Uh, Kurt Wise is a creationist and a geologist. Uh, he's featured quite heavily in, or prominently in the Answers in Genesis website. And here is Kurt quite openly saying, look, it's not about scientific evidence. That there is, that anyone uh, who claims that the earth is young for scientific evidence alone is scientifically ignorant. There's another quote here from, Car uh, from Kurt that I won't bring up because of time constraints. Oh no, there it is anyway. Um, another thing we could do about is there scientific evidence to support a literal creation or a literal genesis? We could ask the courts. This issue has gone before a number of courts around the world. It's been uh, taken into court under various guises, mostly with respect to teaching uh, evolution and creation in schools. And the resounding, uh, the resounding opinion is, uh, the conclusion of the courts is that creationism is religion, it's not a science. Evolution is a science, not a religion, and there is no scientific evidence that supports creationism. If we uh, wanted to show that there is no scientific evidence for creationism, we could actually go to, um, we could go to um, Answers in Genesis website. Why did they change their name? They used to call themselves the Creation Science Foundation. They've backed away from the science, their, re their reasoning being that they recognise that they are now a ministry and that they are not really in the science business. By the way, uh, you can see that the websites are all uh, 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 attached here, so you can follow these through when we put it up. Quick definition of what is a literal creation or a literal interpretation of Genesis uh, and I think Carl would agree with me here, a literal creation holds that the world was created as described in the first two chapters of Genesis, that the universe is 10,000 years old, that it was created in seven literal 24-hour days, well, six actually, God took seventh off, didn't he? And that sometime since the creation of the world, there has been a global flood sometime in the past. There is no scientific evidence that would lead you to believe the world is 10,000 years old, that it was created in seven literal days, or that there has been a global flood. One of my favourite places, the Grand Canyon, it's the most awe-inspiring place you can go, well, apart from Antarctica, but we'll get on to that one later. Um, one of the things you notice is the rocks laid down in layers. Carl showed us rocks laid down in layers. Carl tried to tell us that rocks, all those layers can form really quickly. I'd like Carl to tell us how they can form quickly. We don't know how you can form those sorts of rock layers quickly. And as you can see here, there is, there is over a mile depth of layer upon layer upon layer of rocks. It's like a stack of books. The oldest one has to be at the bottom, and they get progressively younger as you go up. Now, according to Carl and according to the answers in Genesis and the creationist ministries, they will tell you that all of these uh, beds of rock were laid down in the Great Flood. Bit of a problem there. While most of these beds of rock are actually marine or laid down in water situations, or some of them are riverine, this one here, the Coconino sandstone, see it third from the top? That was actually formed in a desert. Oh, it's down here is the Oconino sandstone. Unfortunately, at the bottom of the slide, I knew it was going to have these sorts of problems. It was actually formed in a desert. How do we know? There are fossilised sand dunes in it. You can actually look at the grains of sand in, the, in that sandstone and they have a polish on them, a polish that only desert sand gets. It doesn't get that polish when it's carried around by water. So if the Grand Canyon formed, the sediments of the Grand Canyon formed entirely during the Great Flood, then somewhere around about oh, two-thirds of the way, three-quarters of the way through, for some reason this area became a desert and then it went back to being flooded again. That doesn't actually make much sense. It doesn't accord with a literal interpretation of Genesis, but it does accord with the fact that the, the Earth is very old. It has a long history of laying down these rocks. You've probably all seen this, the geological column, uh, geologic column, 
I knew I should have used a spell checker. Um, Carl mentioned this briefly. Yeah, this was mostly set up by guys who were Christians. Charles Lyle, he started out as a Christian. He became, he, or he, he, he uh, uh, lapsed in Christianity later in his life. People like Cedric, people like Murchison. This is put together simply by going to places like the Grand Canyon and finding out which rocks sit on top of which rocks sit on top of which rocks. And you can follow those beds of rocks around the world and put them together. It became very obvious very clearly, uh, quickly, that there is structure, that there is organisation in the rocks of the world that you wouldn't expect if they were laid down by a flood. A flood would put down a catastrophic mixture of rock, not discrete layers. Another thing they found when they started putting the rocks into, these orga, in, into this order, and this was before science uh, evolution became part of the scientific mainstream, is that there is a pattern, an order of life as represented by the fossils found in those rock beds. It goes from the simple first bacteria through multicellular life, up uh, through birds, dinosaurs, up through, uh, uh, right the way up to us. We're right at the end, by the way, folks, in case you haven't heard. Another thing that was interesting was that one of the reasons why these scientists at the, in the late uh, 1700s and the early 1800s, one reason why they wanted to look at the rocks was to confirm Genesis. They wanted to find evidence of a flood. They wanted to find evidence that life at one start time in the earth had been wiped out. What they actually found was that there's at least five places in the history of the earth where large numbers of organisms were wiped out. So we're not talking about one flood here, we're talking about at least five. It doesn't accord with a literal uh, interpretation of Genesis. Buried forest, this is one of our favourites. Carl loves it, he's, uh, he's got it up on his website. You can find tree stumps that are still in the position that they were in when they grew. Here, for instance, at Joggins in Nova Scotia, this is a diagrammatic representation. What you've got here, this is the soil that the tree grew on. Here's the tree, still upright in its place. It's a tree stump now. It's been buried up to a height of about a metre above the ground, and then more rocks been put in on top. Now, when you ask people like the uh, Answers in Genesis what that's all about, this is from the Answers in Genesis website, it's, it's proof that the flood, that these things had to be buried quickly. One thing that they don't tell you what well, they don't put too much emphasis on is that these tree stumps are scattered through 2,500 feet of rock. What does that mean? If you put them together, you've got tree upon tree upon tree. According to a literal interpretation of Genesis as provided by people like Answers in Genesis, this all had to happen in a year. This was all the result of the flood. That means that this tree had to grow, die, be broken off, get buried, before this tree could grow, die, get buried, and then this tree up the top had to grow, die, and be buried. In some places, there are at least 12 consecutive tree stumps, one on top of the other. How can you grow 12 fully matured trees, one after the other, in a one-year period, which is the period allotted to the Great Flood by Answers in Genesis? I don't think so. Come on, be nice. <laughs> ah, it's the space bar. Here's another similar argument. Here's another similar argument. This is a stratigraphic column, part of the stratigraphic column from uh, a basin in China. You've got layer upon layer upon layer of rock. Where you see the small circles there along the side, that's where there are dinosaur nests. If this was laid down during the Great Flood, then the first dinosaurs swam down to the bottom of the uh, flood waters, made a nest, and remember dinosaurs lived on the land, so why would they be going underwater to make a nest? And then that, that one got filled in, and we had to go up and make another nest full of dinosaurs, and again and again and again, at least seven times in China in this one place, dinosaurs had to make nests on the bottom of the flood waters. It's, it's a nonsense story perfectly uh, uh, in accordance with the idea of an old earth and what you're seeing here is successive years upon years of occupation of a site that gets periodically flooded, maybe in the wet season. Fossil fish, we've already had that. This is Buster, by the way. This is my pet fish. He's so cute. Buster 
pastor, I hadn't been keeping fish for long, but I used to see this quote come out of the creationists. Um, fish normally float when they die. Mine don't. Mine are always found on the bottom of the fish tank. And the bottom of the fish tank, or the bottom of a lake would be the space bar. The, the bottom of the, um, the fish tank would be a logical, or the bottom of a lake would be a logical place to create a fish, a fossil. Carl tells us uh, that, um, that we can't, um, you, you can't have a fish fossil form slowly. Consider trying to make a fish fossil in the flood. You can do this experiment at home. Try it, folks. Take a bucket of gravel, take a bucket of sand, take a fish, stick them in your washing machine on the wash cycle for 40 days, 40 nights ought to do it. If you come up with a perfectly preserved fossil fish, give me a call. It won't happen. Instead, and this is the site, I'm going to just slice forward here to this slide here. What Carl didn't tell you about the Green River Formation, which is one of the sites that he showed you fossil fish from, what he didn't tell you is that it's packed full of varves. Varves, as this slide explains, are fine layers of sediment. They come in couplets. One is silt, one is clay. They form in lakes that are very quiet and are fed by glacial water. So in the spring, the glacial water uh, up in the mountains feeds silt into the system, and then in winter, when the whole system dies down, you can get clay out of it. We can watch valves form today in glacial lakes. You can only form one of these little layers a year. You cannot make them faster than that. In the Green River Formation, where the fossil fish are, there are 50, uh, sorry, there are five million valves, one on top of the other. The only way you can make that, as far as we know, is over five million years. And by the way, in case you're wondering if they really are years that those valves represent, you can look at them and you can see cycles that we know the periodicity of. So we can look, for instance, in the valves and see the periodicity of the El Nino cycle. We can see sunspot activity, etc., etc. They definitely are one a year, and there's 50 million of them. When I went to the Answers in Genesis website to find out how they thought this might be achieved, this was about the best answer I got. But in order to generate 50 million of them in one year, you've got to make nine of these every minute for the whole year. There is no physical way that can be done. If there is, Carl, I, I really would like to know. Biogeography, this is one of the world's cutest animals. <laughs> this is a marsupial mole, Notorictes typhlops. They're only found in the desert regions of Australia. They can only, they're completely blind, they can only move about because uh, by burrowing through loose sand. If these guys survive the Great Flood, according to the model put forward by creationists, somehow this guy had to make it all the way from Australia, where his fossils are found, all the way to the Middle East, where the ark was, get on the ark, float around for a year, and then make his way back all the way to Australia unassisted. Now remember, he can only burrow through loose sand, he's completely blind. Somehow he was able to do that, but like tigers never managed to do that, antelope never made, managed to do that. Biogeography, the way that animals are distributed around the face of the earth, makes sense if the earth is old and if, the earth, if life on earth has evolved. It makes no sense whatsoever under a creationist model. Oh, sorry, this is a, a quote, uh, this Carl there. I noticed Carl didn't, Carl didn't quote me. Um, uh, there's a, a quote there. The, the only way that I can find that they can understand biogeography is to invoke God. God is great for a religious belief, but invoking God to plug up the gaps in a scientific theory is not allowed. You need evidence, and there's no evidence there for it. Christians and, uh, as scientists on radiometric dating. This is a quote. If you want to know about radiometric dating, don't come to me because I'm not an expert in radiometric dating. And I'm also on the other side. I'm not a Christian. <laughs> Go to a Christian website such as this one and they will explain radiometric dating to you. They will explain that despite the protestations of many of the cre uh, creationist groups, radiometric dating is resoundingly good stuff. Answers in Genesis, one of their main arguments against radiometric dating, concerns a fossil from Sydney that's supposed to be 230 million years old. It's supposed to be a piece of wood. And they put it in for carbon-14 dating, and they got an age on that of 33,720 plus or minus 430 years before present. 
It was a wrong test to do. I mean, it's like trying to measure uh, the length of your baby using a, 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 a mile-long ruler. It's, it, it was the wrong test to do. But it's worse than that, because when we contacted the laboratories that actually did the tests, where the tests were submitted, it wasn't even a piece of wood in the first place. It's a concretion, an ironstone concretion. So they've actually put this thing in for a completely pointless test, come up with a really dumb answer, and then said, well, that shows that radiometric dating doesn't work. Uh, transitional forms, I'm really starting to run out of time here. Or am I? Okay. Um, transitional forms, this is another Christian who's written a brilliant website explaining that there are as many transitional forms as we would expect in the fossil record. He will tell you what they are. They're fabulous. Go have a look at what he's got to say. Answers in Genesis says that, uh, actually, Carl's already covered this. But this is my favorite transitional form, Chordipteryx. And it also belies the argument that um, Carl brought up earlier about, well, we can't test what happened in the past. We can, and Chordipteryx was the perfect test. It was only found in 1998. Up until that point, evolutionists realized that birds and small meat eating, di eating dinosaurs were linked that birds evolve from small meat-eating dinosaurs. And we said one day, they will find a bird with, uh, a small meat-eating dinosaur, sorry, with half a wing. And the creationist said, well, <laughs> that's silly. I mean, what's an animal gonna do with half a wing? And the evolutionist said, well, we don't know what it's gonna do with half a wing. 1998, that test was applied when the fossils were found. There's eight of these folks, it's not a fake, it's not something that's been doctored up, it is a small meat-eating dinosaur, it has got feathers on it, and, it, and the feathers are arranged in the pattern of a small wing-like structure on the forearm. When it comes to transitional forms, there are fakes in the record. For instance, Archaeoraptor was a, is, is a well-known fake on the bird dinosaur linkage. Now look at this, if you go to the Answers in Genesis website, they're fascinated with Archaeoraptor. It's a fraud, it was identified as a fraud by evolutionists, it's a red herring in the whole debate about the evolution of birds. But if you do a search, you'll get 42 hits for it. They're fascinated, they're, cons they're obsessed with Archaeoraptor. If you actually look for the species of bird that are important in the whole transitional sequence between birds and dinosaurs, the sum total of all of those different species, which clearly demonstrate the evolution of birds and, from dinosaurs, doesn't come up to anything like the number of hits you get for the red herring. Similarly, Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man, these are fraud, or one was a fraud, one was a mistaken identity. Piltdown Man hasn't been used in a, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I knew I was gonna have too much. Anyway, um, there's plenty more evidence that maybe you should be thinking about carefully understanding what it is that answers in Genesis are saying to you, because on many occasions they have been demonstrated to be wrong. Thank you very much. We now have 15 minutes for each speaker to rebut arguments, data, presentations made in the first 20 minutes. It's a pleasure to call on Dr. Carl to start his 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'd be in a position to know why we changed our name. Uh, uh, did we back away from science because we're now a ministry? We've always been a ministry. We've always said we were. And we've never changed our emphasis. We've, we've more and more been aware of the authority of the Bible as important in all this, but we now have more PhD scientists working for us than ever before. 11 at last count. In fact, the reason was um, because we were sick of getting confused in the United States, particularly you'd ring up a pastor and say, do you want ministry? You know, we were called creation science there. And they'd think it was Christian science or Scientology and things like that. By the way, it's not strictly true that Lyell was a Christian in the biblical sense. He and a lot of other people like him were really best called deists. And I don't believe that he was one of the uh, people who uh, actually put together the geological column. And it's not strictly true. One of the scientists working for us has a PhD in the history of geology. Uh, it's not strictly true that these people were out there sort of, you know, wanting to confirm the flood and so on. So, but that's, um, you know, neither of us are experts in that historical area. But the Coconino sandstone, if what uh, we heard was correct, that the Coconino sandstone definitely formed in a desert condition, well, that would be a huge problem uh, for the explanation of the flood. Although some people would say, well, it just tells you where the flood, post-flood boundary was. But in fact, uh, 
rather than a sort of a cursory hunt through the website, a, a detailed look at our literature, including the website, would have shown a major paper that was produced some time ago, which was based upon secular geological works, showing that the, you know, that's yesterday's geology, the idea that the Coconina sandstone was formed in desert conditions. In fact, these so-called sand dunes are really underwater sand waves. And uh, there is enormous evidence for that. For one thing, the footprints of amphibians are found buried in that, in that um, sedimentary rock. And Dr. Ariel Roth has done experiments in flume tanks showing you how these particular footprints could have formed underwater and then been buried by the next wave of sediment. So the Coconino sandstone is a marine formation. And speaking of flume experiments, you know, we heard that the flood would give you a mixture and not layers. Uh, I mean, that, that really is uh, just not the case. Uh, Mount St. Helens, for instance, showed us how in one afternoon, thousands of individual micro laminations formed, about eight metres of them uh, on June the 12th, 1980, uh, as a, a, a sedimentary event. You don't need millions of years to get these individual layers. Flume experiments performed at the University of Colorado by uh, Guy Bateau and I believe his name was Pierre Julien and others showed that you could take mixtures of particles and you could run it through, put those particles into running water and you would get lamination forming by a self-sorting process. And so the, the thought came, well, maybe this is how these valves might have formed. Some of these rhythmites, which are often interpreted as valves, some of them might be valves, by the way, but by the way, you can get in glacial lakes today, you can get more than one set of couplets per year. So that's, uh, that, that theory is not, not correct either. And all of the documentation for this is available either on our website or uh, by, by writing to us. But it's always documenting from secular sources. But so this uh, uh, Guy Bateau decided to take a rock with some of these rhythmites. I'm talking about bands of alternating dark and light rock, for example, ground it up put it into the flume tank, and he found that no matter what the velocity of flow, in every case, those layers would reform. In other words, it's a question of physics. It's not a question of time. Um, trees uh, in position of growth. You know, I'm, I'm surprised that that Joggins example was given when, uh, you know, a much better example from an evolutionary viewpoint is usually the uh, trees at Yellowstone, where you have all these petrified forests, one on top of another. And in both cases, evolutionists assume because they're upright, they must be grown in place. But in fact, Mount St. Helens showed when you had all of those trees ripped off in that huge catastrophe and they were floating on top of Spirit Lake, as the trees got waterlogged, they started to sink, but they didn't sink at once, they started to float upright because that's where the denser wood is at the base. And then when they finally became waterlogged, they would go down to the bottom, chunk, 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 and there's documentation, videos of the bottom of the lake showing you how this volcanic sedimentation, ash and so on is forming, and you have these one after the other going in there like that, indicating that if somebody came along you know, many years later, they would think, well, hey, these are forests grown in place. In fact, you'll find that these trees, their roots are torn off. There's no evidence of the, uh, even the ones that we saw, of the soils in which they were supposed to be growing and so on. And incidentally, my understanding of the Joggins trees, and I'm willing to be corrected on this, but I've seen pictures where, yes, they do go through two and a half thousand feet, but they don't go through these, you know, one layer after another separated like that. They actually overlap to a large extent. Fish normally float, and so we were shown some fish that don't float. That doesn't refute the statement which I repeat, and if anybody saw Crocodile Dundee 2, you'd know that m <laughs> most fish do float, which is all I've ever said. And uh, certainly you don't see fish lying on the bottom of the sea waiting to be slowly and gradually fossilised. Incidentally, um, when you have uh, th th this concept of how to form a fossil fish, if you bury, we actually teach primary school kids to do experiments on how to make fossil fish. You get the right cementing ingredients and you bury your fish in something that cements, hardens within a few weeks at the most, then you do get these impressions left behind. But if you just let your fish lie on the bottom of the floor, even if you remove all the oxygen and you remove all the bacteria and so on, after about four or five weeks, and this has been done in secular experiments, that they just fall apart. The Green River Formation. Fascinating that you'd bring that up. I mean, we've done article after article on that, showing you how you've got this evidence, like the fish that I showed you, 
of rapid burial and rapid preservation within those layers that are supposedly laid down slowly year after year. In fact, there was a paper showing that it's loaded with fish feces. Do you know how long fish feces last in water unless they're, they're buried and, and preserved? But there's one clincher argument which would have been seen in our literature in an article called Green River Blues by a geologist called Paul Garner. In the Green River Formation, you have horizons which everybody agrees are one single volcanic event, like an, a, a layer of ash. And then above it, there's another layer. And you have lots of these valves in between. Now, if these valves were really annual events, then you should be able to count those layers on one side or the other side or anywhere, the number of layers in between those horizons, which each represent one volcanic eruption, should be the same. In fact, they're radically different, showing you that, that you know, there's uh, excellent evidence that the uh, layers are not annual events in some sort of a clock. The marsupial mole, uh, there's a bit of careful reading of the quote that, I, that, that was up there by myself. Well, wasn't that God took the marsupial mole from Australia and plucked it and, and in a, you know, off to where Noah was? The whole point is that uh, the animal distribution that we have today is not the same as before the flood. In fact, the whole idea of continental drift came from the book of Genesis, a creationist called Antonio Snyder. Genesis says the waters are gathered in one place, so that means the land is somewhere else. And so he said, well, there was one continent before the flood. Whether that's so or whether that's not, we know one thing, that it was no Australia before the flood. The whole distribution of the continents now would be radically different by definition if there was such a massive catastrophe. So marsupial moles or their kind ancestor, their less specialised ancestor may have been living within a stone's throw of where Noah was building the ark. As to how it got to Australia afterwards, remember this, number one, from the best models of post-flood climate to do with post-flood ice ages and so on, there would have been, because of these warmer waters, much more precipitation, give you an exp excellent explanation for the ice, by the way, and there would have been massive amounts of rainfall in central Australia. Everybody agrees that Sahara, central Australia, used to be lush forests and so on. And also, when creatures have this downhill change that I pointed out, like dogs becoming different breeds and so on, they specialise, they become less adaptable. And therefore, uh, we're convinced that the ancestor of today's, you know, koala or platypus and so on was much more robust a a as a creature. And uh, in fact, uh, the Paul's fellow sceptic, Michael Archer, uh, has published evidence showing you that the uh, platypus ancestor was a much more robust fellow than the, uh, the timid little guy that we have today. And uh, about the wood in carbon-14, you know, um, I could spend some time disputing that concept that that was uh, allegedly not wood based upon the memory of some uh, uh, person in a radiometric dating laboratory. I think the embarrassment would have to be on them because they went ahead and did uh, these uh, delta corrections, all of these complicated tests to try and eliminate contamination from that specimen, to try and work out whether the C13, C12 isotope ratios in that wood were, you know, from uh, contamination or from the way the wood grew in the first place and they would have certainly told us that or should have in the report that this really wasn't wood. But let's leave that to one side because we've published heaps of instances of carbon-14 results from things millions of years old including the Crinum coal mine in central Queensland where they drilled a ventilation shaft through so-called Triassic basalt where the potassium argon dates were 45 million years and this wood was charred by the lava that had flowed around it. Basalt is volcanic rock and there was even a leaf impression there and we even had a tree expert identify the species of trees, so undoubtedly tree and once again we got an age of, of in the tens of thousands of years. What are we saying? We're saying that, you know, Paul's right, if you're an evolutionist, you're a believer in millions of years, then there's no way, it's stupid to do a carbon-14 test, there shouldn't be any more carbon-14. Should be all gone, but there it is. And in fact, the amazing thing is, in one of these uh, bombshell papers that have been just recently published by the so-called rape group, and you'll see all the information on that on our website, um, you'll find that uh, there's been a lot of specimens sent for radiocarbon dating from even layers that are non-organic, that are pre-flood, there, there seems to be primordial carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 should be all gone after, you know, a few tens of thousands of years shouldn't be anymore. The clincher is the recent, very, very recent uh, result, carbon-14, 
positive carbon-14 from a diamond. A diamond, the bonds are so strong, there's no way that any contamination can get in there. Somehow people are saying, well, there must be something wrong with our machines and, and this sort of thing, but uh, the evidence is very clear. As far as Chordipteryx con is concerned, I didn't say um, that you can't test the past, by the way. We just grabbed some quotes here. What I said is that you can't repeat it or observe it. You can test it by means of, you know, the forensic science type method. But Chordipteryx, in case you got the impression that this was some sort of an ancestor of birds with uh, half wing, half limb and so on, evolutionists believe that the first bird was Archaeopteryx. And they date that at 153 million years. But Chordipteryx is dated at 125 million years. Now let me just quote from some evolutionists, experts in birds and so on, who are <coughs> certainly anti-creationists, right? But they're also anti this idea that dinosaurs could have evolved from birds, uh, sorry, birds could have evolved from dinosaurs. They've got other ideas. Now here's one of them. His name is Dr. Storrs Olson. He's the creator of birds at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian. He says, this was in an open letter to uh, um, uh, National Geographic. He said, the idea of feathered dinosaurs and the theropod dinosaur origin of birds is being actively promulgated by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geograph Geographic who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. Truth and careful scientific weighing of evidence have been among the first casualties in their program. There was another paleontologist from the University of Kansas, Larry Martin. He commented on the grip of this paradigm, this belief that you know, birds are living dinosaurs. And this was in the context of another feathered dinosaur claim. He said this, you have to put this in pers into perspective. To the people who wrote the paper, the chicken would be a feathered dinosaur. Now, I don't want to uh, embarrass Paul, but we were having a discussion with one of his friends earlier, uh, he indicated that um, one of the things he does is to dissect chickens and show people that they're dinosaurs. This is another um, quote from Fiducia, Alan Fiducia, who's chairman of biology at the University of North Carolina. He, he published conclusive evidence from ostrich eggs that dinosaurs could not have evolved into birds. He says, this creates a new problem, and I'm quoting, for those who insist that dinosaurs were ancestors of modern birds. How can a bird hand, for example, with digits two, three, and four evolve from a dinosaur hand that has only digits one, two, and three? That would be almost impossible. That was published in Naturwissenschaften in 2002. Chordipteryx and Protarchaeopteryx, according to Fiducia and co, were almost certainly not dinosaurs, but actually flightless birds. Chordipteryx actually had gizzard stones like birds do. Well, I think that's... Uh, probably as much as I should say. Let's hand over now to Dr Paul, shall we? Welcome, Dr Paul. I don't know if you've realised it, but you've actually been shown no evidence tonight that supports a literal genesis. What I mean is there is no one piece of evidence that's come forward that says the world is 10,000 years old. There is no one piece of evidence that's come forward and said that the world was made in seven days. Six, if you include the fact that God had Sunday off. And there is no evidence presented that there was a worldwide global flood. Now, Carl started out by saying, well, if... <laughs> even the papers against me tonight said that, well, look, there's only two options, so if evolution and science is wrong, then creation must be right. There's about a billion Hindus who would take issue with that. They have a completely different understanding about the origin of the world, and then so do the Aboriginals in Australia, they have a number of different creation myths and stories about where we came from. Simply trying to poke holes in evolution is not evidence for a literal creation. We have not seen a single piece that has come forward and said the world is 10,000 years old, seven days flat, etc., etc. All we've seen is some attacks on evidence that the world's very old or that, the, or that life has evolved. Even if those arguments were correct, it doesn't mean that it's support for a literal creation. Carl, it's really interesting that you decided to bring in the idea of information and specified complexity and that sort of stuff, because on your own website, you yourself bring up the fact that they are bad arguments for creationists to use. Why? For exactly the same reason I've just outlined. Even if you're right, 
even if there's information there and we can't explain the whole information thing, which, again, I'm going to take issue with in a moment, even if that's correct, it doesn't mean the world was made 10,000 years ago, seven days, da 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 It is not evidence for a literal creation. And Carl, you yourself said that on your website, and the, the uh, creationists should be very careful about using the arguments from the uh, intelligent design community in favour of creationism. And if you are going to tell us about information and specified complexity, can you tell us exactly what you're talking about? Because it's not a concept common in biology. You cannot measure the information concept. What are you going to do? You're going to count the number of base pairs in the DNA, or you're going to count the um, number of digits, or how complicated it looks. You can't quantify information. At the moment, the intelligent design community headed up by the Discovery Institute are trying to come forward with a theory of information which is basically a coupled together of two theories, one stolen from mathematics and one stolen from computing science. Either way, you don't end up being able to say how much information there is in an organism. So talking about information increasing and decreasing, I mean, when we got down to chordipteryx, there's case, it, Carl, if you say that chordipteryx is a bird, well, then it's evolved more information in evolving a dinosaur-like tail, which is more complicated than a bird-like tail. It's evolved more information in, in developing a uh, bird -like, uh, reptilian foot, or uh, mammal, I'll get it right in a minute, a carnivorous dinosaur foot rather than the uh, simpler bird foot. It's evolved more information in trying to, uh, in, in developing a, uh, a, a, a hand with separate fingers on it rather than all fused together as they are in a bird. The whole concept of information in biology, as wielded by the creationist, is a nonsense. It cannot even be defined. Uh, we had stuff about rates of evolution and that, you know, we didn't need dingoes and wolves and dogs to all be taken on the, on the uh, ark because, well, you only had to take on one dog kind and all other dog kinds could evolve from it after the flood. If they're evolving that rapidly, we ought to be able to measure it in their genomes, and we can't. The other thing is, is that, well, let's extend the argument. What is this kind concept? Can you define it for me? I mean, maybe Noah only needed to take himself on the boat to produce all of the apes of the world. We're all ape kind. I mean, there is no definition of this concept of kind, and it's just a flexible grab bag that creationists have been using for far too long. Um, Carl used the phrase, many modern geologists believe or many, uh, that, that layers can be put down quickly or uh, that he's got 11 PhD students working with him. Don't be fooled, folks. Scientists working in creationism are a minority by a vast, vast factor. By way of demonstration, you can go to in six days, 50 creationists talk out about why they believe in the Bible, uh, in, in creation. You can go to their website. They've got 100 scientists. You can also go to Project Steve, which has, at the moment, 393 PhD scientists who have signed on saying that they accept evolution and that creationism is a farce. And they're all named Steve. If you multiply that out across the population, that means there's something like 39,000 PhDs out there who accept evolution, accept an old earth. And the important thing is, many of them are Christians. Um, there was the layers at Mount St. Helens argument brought out. And this is, I, 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 can't, I can't believe that Carl actually brought this out, to be honest, folks because it's, a, it's such a dupe to pull on you. You see, Mount St. Helens, the layers, or the layer-like structures, they're not even proper layers, that were formed at Mount St. Helens, were formed with dry dust and hot air, gas, gaseous uh, hot air blowing through, billowing down in a pyroclastic flow, forming layers. We've known that you can form layers quickly that way. Carl has then expanded that and said, well, in that case, all layers around the world can be created quickly. Let me give you an analogy. Carl watched Backyard Blitz last night. He saw them take this paddock that didn't even have proper grass in it 
And in five hours, folks, they had a fantastic garden, they had a lawn, they had a bit of a patio, had a little fernery, a little water feature, it was fabulous. So if they can build that garden in five hours, all gardens can be built in five hours. Those botanic gardens down the road, 150 years old? Nah. I've seen them built in five hours, so all gardens can be built in five hours. Yes, Carl, we do know that in some situations you can form layers quickly, but in most situations you cannot, and you have never demonstrated this. Simply going to flume experiments that in a laboratory setting, in a contrived laboratory setting, produce some layer-like structures is not adequate to explain how the Grand Canyon formed. Um, you also mentioned that you found an experiment where more than one set of couplets of valves were formed uh, in a year. Well, yes, there have been one or two cases of that. I'm aware of that. But don't forget, Carl, we're not talking about f forming three or four couplets of valves in a year. You, you need at least a million. You're out by a huge factor. You cannot deposit clay out of water quickly. You certainly can't build up five million valves in a year. And Carl said, look, um, yeah, so these things in the Green River, you know, these valves, like, how, how good are they? Because in one place there's lots of them and in other places there's not quite so many and you can tell by the ash layers and all that. Who said the, the valves have to stretch out over the whole lake? The valves don't have to spread out everywhere, so if you're closer to where the source of the, set, uh, the silt is coming in, you will get more valves than if you're out in the middle of the lake. Because when you're close to the source, and it's a year where there's not a lot of silt coming in, that's where the silt's going to settle, it's not going to go across the middle of the lake. So the fact that there's different layers in different parts of the lake doesn't matter. You also used another argument that on your website you said you shouldn't use that it's bad arguments for creationists. In fact, there are uh, a whole page of answers, you know, answers in Genesis of arguments that creationists should no longer use. These were arguments that we were telling them they shouldn't have started with in the first place. But one of the arguments there was, you shouldn't use the argument about, well, if I'm alive and I'm a human and we descended from apes, how come there's apes around today? I call this the cousin uh, uh, paradox. Because me and my cousin came from the same grandparents, how come they're still alive? It's not a problem. The family grows, it splits it as it goes along. Where did he use this argument fallaciously? When he tried to say, well, Archaeopteryx occurs in the fossil record before Chordipteryx, and therefore, you know, Archaeopteryx is like more bird-like, and so how can it be further back? Well, it's back because the, we're seeing the remains of uh, evolution that has gone on in the past, at later levels of the fossil record. It's no mystery. Uh, what else? Anyone else got any of the, the questions that they wanted to ask of Carl's uh, evidence? Because all I can find, I mean, the, the real problem with attacking Carl is that all of these arguments have been refuted over and over again. Um, he, uh, th there was the, the question of the origin of life. Look, even if we don't know the origin of life, even if we don't know how life got started, that's not evidence that the world is 10,000 years old, built in seven days, and subject to a global flood. Uh, I, I, I'm really going to leave it there, folks. I'd like to bang on all night, but I'm, uh, but I'm not going to. Because I, ha I, I really want to hear from Carl what specific piece of evidence he can give me that the world's 10,000 years old. What specific piece of evidence he can give me that the world was made in seven days. And what specific piece of evidence he can give me that there was a global flood. Because so far, everything he has said has been demonstrated again and again to be incorrect. Each speaker has talked to you for 35 minutes. And you should be starting to make up some of your mind about what are the sorts of things they're going to conclude in their remaining 10 minutes. I invite Dr. Carl to conclude his arguments. Mr. Chairman, I've been asked to provide that one piece of evidence for a young world. I believe I have provided that evidence consistent with it, and that is that uh, helium diffusion evidence, which was totally ignored. 
Uh, it might, might be worthwhile listening to the tape afterwards and seeing how the, it dates those zircons and therefore the Precambrian granite at uh, 5,000 something years plus or minus 2,000 years. Now if that's not direct evidence for a young world, I don't know what is. The suggestion that poking holes in evolution is not evidence for creation, I tried to deal with that at the beginning. In logic, that's simply known as the law of the excluded middle. Incidentally, evolutionists ever since Darwin have done that all the time. They've said, you know, God wouldn't do it this way, so evolution must have done it, and so on. And by the way, the whole issue of uh, information, if biologists aren't aware of what it means, then that's not my problem. It's very common in information theory and computer science and so on, and there is some marrying of the two disciplines, and that's why Dr. Spetner uh, ended up with, uh, he's a biophysicist, uh, as a research fellow in Johns Hopkins, looking at exactly that issue. Signal noise relationships, those are terms in information theory, and if you read his book and it, and a few other titles are available from the church bookshop, then he defines his terms very carefully and he talks about enzymes becoming less specific on the substrate. There's, there's no sort of fuzziness about that at all. And incidentally, I, I have been misrepresented in this whole issue of the ID movement. I've never said you don't use the information argument at all and I invite anyone to scan my website. And the story that Cordypteryx is you know, it must have evolved this or it must have evolved that. Whatever features Cordyp Cordypteryx may or may not have, obviously I'm not arguing that they evolved. Um, incidentally, uh, when I talked about, you know, many modern geologists, there was a real confusion there. Um, I was, not in what I was saying, but in the way it was interpreted subsequently, and I apologise if I caused that, but I certainly agree that creationists are in a minority, even though that Steve-type sampling and when the same sort of thing was done using the Los Alamos uh, scientific community, it indicated that in the United States alone there were probably about 10,000 PhD scientists who believe in Genesis creation, but only a handful of those are involved in the creation movement. So I totally agree. When I said many modern geologists, I wasn't referring to creationists. My whole point was that many millions of years believers are now saying, well, it looks like the layers really did form quickly. And foremost among them, I'll just name one so it's not fuzzy, is Dr. Derek Ager, who was uh, past president of the British Geological Association, professor of geology at the University of Swansea, and definitely no biblical creationist. The comment was sort of many are Christians. Well, that's true. I mean, many people call themselves all sorts of things, but I know once at the University of Queensland, I was interrupted rudely and so on by some people and one of them got up at the end and he said, I'm a Christian and I'm telling you you can believe in evolution and this, that. And I spoke to him afterwards and I wanted to sort of say, you know, friendly things and find out where he was coming from and so on. And, and I was going to say to him, do you believe that God is love? Because my whole point was if he said, well, because of this passage in the Bible, I was going to say, well, how come if you believe that the Bible has got mistakes in it? Maybe that's one of the mistakes where it says God is love. But for some reason or another, I said, um, you know, do you believe in life after death? I was trying to find something, some common ground that obviously every Christian believes in. And he said, I believe I have eternal life. And I thought, that's a strange way of answering that. So I said, I'll answer, ask in a different way. I'll ask, do you believe that in 10,000 years time after your mortal body has rotted away that you, and I named his name, will still be here in some self-conscious form somewhere? And he looked very ashamed, almost like someone had been caught with a hand in a cookie jar. And he looked down at his feet and he said, no. And I found that over and over again, that just, you know, dressing up in, in a red uniform doesn't make you a soldier of King George. Friends, um, the, co the comment about uh, sedimentary layers at Mount St. Helens, you know, you heard this confident comment, we knew that layers could form like that in pyroclastic flows. Do you know when Dr. Stephen Austin gave that information, presented it at the at a, a petroleum geologist's meeting of over 1,000 North American petroleum geologists, there was a hushed silence. And after a considerable time, the chairman said, gentlemen, looks like we'd better rethink this whole issue of catastrophism in geology. I didn't say, by the way, that I've shown that all can be laid down quickly. What I'm saying is that the common belief that you heard that one catastrophe, you heard it tonight, can't possibly lay down lots of different layers and so on. That's not correct. And the flume experiments, you know, it's valid in science. This is the best you can come to as far as experimental evidence is concerned. Surely people should be commended for trying 
to emulate in the laboratory these sorts of things. And I think it is incredibly powerful that you can take a rock that's been interpreted as having these different little layers that are supposed to have formed over all these, you know, five million years and whatever, grind it up, put it in the flume and show that the same thing comes out again, not to do with time, but rather to do with uh, the laws of physics and chemistry. And uh, <coughs> as far as the arguments about the apes and people and the feathered dinosaurs, you know, all of the feathered dinosaurs in Liaoning, Liaoning is that part of China where all these came out. In fact, it was one Paul Willis that said, you know, uh, God created Liaoning to show how much he hates creationists. A and uh, I say that lightheartedly, but that, that was a, an accurate quote. But all of those feathered dinosaurs that have been variously trumpeted as, as different, uh, and I put feathered dinosaurs in quote marks, by the way, for a, a very good reason, um, that have been trumpeted as, you know, ancestral to birds and so on, every one of them is dated not only at uh, some 20 million or so years younger than Archaeopteryx, the first bird, but also about 10 million years younger than Confucianus. There's a very modern type uh, bird, a beak bird and so on. And, you know, what I'm saying is that Sure, you can argue that in some situations an ancestral population might last alongside the other population for another few years and so on, but to argue that this happened over tens of millions of years in every single situation, there is a term known as special pleading. Mr Chairman, I think that in this brief time we've seen at least an outline. I mean, both Paul and I are limited by time, and, and I recognise that and I hope you do too of the way in which the evidence strongly supports Genesis, a literal Genesis, as written. You know, to say, can you show me how God could have created in six days, give me this evidence, that's like saying, you know, Paul, can you turn a reptile into a bird in front of me or something like that. That's not the way the science of the past works. We live in an incredibly complex, fine-tuned world and we've seen no hint of an explanation as to how such complex things could have arisen in the first place, nor have we heard any evidence of an adequate mechanism to progressively add this information. We've had laboratory evidence presented that powerfully suggests that the world is only thousands and not billions of years old. At the same time, we see disease, degradation, violence and decay all around us, consistent with the Genesis curse because of sin. I recall when we interviewed Dr Ian McCready, and we interview in each creation magazine, we try to interview one very prominent scientist to try and uh, encourage people that believes the Bible and so on. And Dr. McCready is Australia's top molecular biologist. He won the, whatever it was, Frank Hardy Prize or something. He's head of the Molecular Biology Laboratory in Melbourne for the CSIRO. And he totally believes the Bible. And he said, what I see, which shows you how, by the way, the, the glasses that you have on influence the way you see the evidence. He says, what I see, I don't see things building themselves up. I see things falling apart running down. Friends, my, my grandfather was enculturated into accepting evolution and therefore rejecting the truth of the Bible's history and thus the good news of the gospel. The arguments that convinced him were discarded by the time my father came along and the arguments that convinced him of evolution and to reject the gospel were a different set of arguments. And by the time I got to uni and became an evolutionist, they were a different set of arguments again. The arguments come and go. What doesn't change is the underlying faith that evolution has somehow happened. And because it's all about, you know, things like faith and science, both viewpoints have uh, scientific aspects, both have faith, faith aspects, it's not out of court to talk about overall faith issues to say that the aim of answers in Genesis is to unashamedly introduce people to the Lord Jesus Christ as creator and redeemer, the one who taught and believed in a literal Genesis, that literal historical fall of mankind as the reason why he came as the creator made flesh and as the only name under heaven through which keep people can be saved. And he vindicated the truth of it all by rising from the dead with heaps of historical evidence attesting to that fact. Our ministry has the highest regard for science, which we believe is a God-ordained activity. We believe that evolution has deplorable consequences for good science. Dr Whitten, professor of genetics at the University of Melbourne, said in 1980, biologists are simply naive when they talk about experiments to test the theory of evolution, it is not testable. They may happen to stumble across facts which would seem to conflict with its predictions. These facts will invariably be ignored and their discoverers will undoubtedly be deprived of continuing research grants. That doesn't sound like a recipe for getting at the truth of something, which is what science is supposed to be about. Thank you. Paul, as last speaker, welcome to your 10 minutes for conclusion. Um, 
I asked for a piece of evidence that the world is 10,000 years old, built, made in seven days, and that there has been a global flood. And this would be the evidence we would expect to see if a literal genesis is true. Instead, I get one piece of information proffered forward, a study on a piece of granite that I have not seen the tests on. I've, it, it, apparently, it was only announced last week. Is that right, Carl? No? For weeks. Okay, so it's been up on creationist websites for weeks. I'm not particularly sure of this piece of evidence, folks. But if it are going to handle testing minerals and testing radiometric dating the way that they handled their piece of wood, which isn't a piece of wood, I am putting no faith that those tests were done fairly or honestly. And more to the point, why proffer me one piece of information that I can't check? when if what you're saying is right, the world should be resplendent with information showing us that the world is 10,000 years old, made in seven days, and that there was a worldwide global flood. Instead, we see that the world is very old. We see layers of rock that cannot be produced quickly. This, well, maybe the flume experiments in California might one day make a quick valve, is not good enough, Carl, and you know it. You cannot make valves quickly. The idea that uh, information th uh, has been defined and measured, that's news to me because I've been keeping up on the reading on that one and they still can't do it. About It's increasing here and it's decreasing there. They still have not come forward and told us what the information is. Where do you point to in an organism and say, this is your information quotient. This is what we're measuring when we're talking about how much information you've got. The fact is, it doesn't exist. There is no such measurement. There is no such definition that works. Chordiptrix came up again. Good old Chordiptrix, my favourite transitional fossil. There was a question about, um, uh, well, uh, I'm not saying that it evolved these features. The point I was making was that if you call it a bird, then why has it got the tail of a meat-eating dinosaur? Why has it got the feet of a meat-eating dinosaur? Why has it got the hands of a meat-eating dinosaur? And these are distinctly different from those of a bird. It's got half a wing. We predicted that one day an animal would be found with half a wing if birds evolved from dinosaurs. You mentioned Fiducia and Martin, uh, a couple of geologists, uh, a couple of paleontologists who do have a different interpretation on the origin of birds. They are very much in the minority. But you do get different opinions in science. What's wrong with that? But to pick on them and say that Chordiptrix is therefore somehow not half a dinosaur and half a bird is fudging the issue. The idea that because we have this range of animals in Lyoning in China that show varying degrees of the uh, transitional sequence from a small meat-eating dinosaur with hair-like structures on it through to a more bird-like dinosaur that has got downy feathers on it, through to a much more bird-like dinosaur, which has actually got fully fledged feathers on it, arranged in the same pattern as a wing, through to fully formed birds. The fact that they all occur in the same place, we're not talking that they're ancestral in that site, we're talking that they are the lineal descendants of an evolutionary process that went on earlier. The testimony of a Christian evolutionist that Carl gave us, that he confronted someone who said that they're a Christian and they're an evolutionist, and so Carl talked about the afterlife and this, that, and the other. In my presentation, which will be up on the website, late, uh, which will be up on the website, both for this church, but also for answers in Genesis, uh, well, sorry, no answers in Genesis, the antidote to answers in Genesis. By the way, um, w w the, the uh, email address for that is a little bit complicated and John in the audience does have copies of it for you to be able to find it. You might wonder why they don't just call it noanswersingenesis.com. Well, for some reason, answers in Genesis own that domain name. So much for promoting free speech. They also own noanswersingenesis.org, just to make sure. 
Nice to know we've got a, a proponent of free and fair discussion in the audience. Um, the idea that uh, accepting evolution means rejecting the Bible is plainly not true for the vast majority of Christians around the world. Most Christian scientists are quite happy to accept the fact that God is the creator, but that the world is very old and that life has evolved. I was actually, when I was prepping for this the other day, I thought, time for a lifeline. Uh, I went round, I was going to phone up a few friends and find out what they thought. I ended up talking to a friend of mine who's a Uniting Church minister, a guy by the name of Do Reverend Dr. David Millican. And he, as a minister of the Uniting Church, also accepts that the world is extremely old, about 4.6 billion. He also accepts that life has evolved on the face of the earth and he's still a minister of religion. He said that what's important for a Christian when coming to terms with the scientific reality of the world around us, what Genesis teaches us is that God is powerful and a creator. And that's all you need to know. And that comes from Martin Luther way back before the whole evolutionary debate. Martin Luther was not a biblical literalist. So the idea that, um, that just because you can buttonhole one um, a Christian who calls themselves an evolutionist at a meeting and makes themselves known and find out about their afterlife... Well, I don't think you should be casting aspersions on all Christians who are also scientists and who do happily have the two together. In fact, they tell me that their appreciation of God's creation is that much better because it's much more awesome, that it's so old, it's so huge, it's so complex. The idea that evolution cannot be tested... Uh, or evolution is not testable. And we got into the whole thing, well, Carl decided to bring up the thing about uh, observability. Observability is not part of science philosophy. You go to Karl Popper. Karl Popper, who is, is the, the, the grandfather of science philosophy that we use today as working scientists, actually said that evolution is testable. It is, in every way, a real science. It does not need to be observable. Um, in the same way that gravity is not observable, we can't actually see what gravity is. We can test its existence. I can drop a pen and it goes to the floor. But we still don't actually know what gravity is. In the same way, we can test the existence of evolution. We can test the existence of an old planet by going out there and looking at the rocks and figuring out how they were put together. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I come back to the point that by now I hope you're sick and tired of. And that is, the topic of tonight's debate was, does scientific evidence support a literal genesis? Does scientific evidence show that the world is 10,000 years old, made in seven days, and that there was a global flood? And the answer is a resounding no. There is no scientific evidence that accords with that. I thank you very much for listening to me tonight. And please, go in peace. Thanks, Paul. You had 65 seconds to go. You've had two speakers tonight who are engaged in their literature. They're engaged in searching for big questions. And I trust tonight you are more informed You've heard their arguments, you've heard their way of thinking, you've seen some of their sources, and now I hand it to you. Where do you stand on questions that have been asked tonight? Because you've been more informed than you have been in the past. But I ask you not to make too many closed questions too quickly. Keep a more open mind to the task. And don't just think, I'm that way or that way, or he spoke louder than that one, or he's got more evidence than that one. No. Ask yourself some tough questions about the question that was asked of our two speakers tonight. And I think they've done a fantastic job in representing their points of view, in sticking to the broad rules of the debate, in working within the time frames. And I would like you to stand and applaud both speakers in acclamation as we thank them.
while you're standing as we bring this service to a close, they've put a lot of time into their efforts to find out where they stand on the question that's been asked tonight. Where do you stand on that question? I leave it in your hands. They have um, invited you, should you want to talk with them, to come down to my right-hand side of the, the um, carpet here. They would like to talk with you one-on-one -on -one for a reasonable amount of time uh, to answer your questions one-on-one. -on -one. They're not going to answer questions in public tonight, but should you wish to, um, Carl and Paul will be available here to talk to you. I think it's my, my duty and responsibility now to thank everybody for participating in such a debate and being such a fantastic audience as well. I think you've done a terrific job and I want to applaud you in being attentive, focused on what's happening, listening, and well as having about an hour and a half of additional information into your hands that you didn't have perhaps when you first came here. So can I applaud you? You've done a great job. It's been great to be here with you tonight. I hereby declare the debate closed and now I'll hand over to Pastor John Lewis. We ought to give our moderator just a fantastic applause. <laughs> Wonderful. I don't know about you, but I wasn't game to move. I thought I would have got a yellow card real quick. But, but set the tone for such a wonderful uh, debate, and I do thank both you, Dr. Carl and Dr. Paul, for such a wonderful presentation. I close with this last thought. There was a man by the name of Tony Compolo. He is a PhD in sociology. He was lecturing at a university. One of his students in the question time said, Dr. Campolo, I'm amazed a man of your education and intellectual prowess can believe in that Bible. I'm amazed. And Dr. Campolo said to this young man, please don't do me any injustice here. He said, I'm like you. I made a decision about the Bible. I decided to believe it. Then I pursued to fulfill my belief by reinforcing that belief. But you've done exactly the same. You've decided not to believe, believe the Bible and you've pursued to find all the arguments against the Bible. And tonight we've had an argument presented. And I've got to tell you, I thought it was really well presented. These guys have done us proud. Their, their research and their answers and their rebuttals to each other, I thought was just excellent. And I just feel so much more informed. I feel so much better for being here tonight. But I have made up my mind before I got here and because of my age, I'm still going to be the pastor here. <laughs> and I'd like you to consider that the question that has been proposed to you tonight, considered in the larger picture, that if the Bible is true, it has a whole lot of other connotations attached to it, none less than your eternal destiny, your eternal life. That ought to be a part of your perception of the truth as well. As we've said... Carl and Paul will be over here after to speak to you about any particular scientific issue you may have. Over here, a couple of our pastors will be here. Maybe you're here tonight and you, you say, look, I'm, I really am interested in my spiritual future. Could somebody help me? A couple of our people will be here just to help you. One more thing before you go home. Would you help us? We've got a form available here being passed out that helps you to just help us to know how you felt about tonight's meeting. If we ever do this again... We'd like to do it with uh, a sense of knowing that what we have done, we did well, and we want to know your results, what you feel about this debate. So would you just take out two minutes, fill out that form, and somebody's going to collect that form. Anyway, maybe you just take a second to do that.